My name is Nick Josefowitz. I'm the I'm Spurs um, Chief of Policy. Um, thank you so much for tuning into this digital discourse today. To provide a little background for some people who may not be familiar with SPUR, we're a nonprofit member supported organization that promotes good planning and good government through research, education, and advocacy. We put ideas and action together to make a better city and a better region. Many of you here today are members, so thank you for your support. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join to support SPUR's ongoing work in making our cities and region more prosperous, sustainable, and equitable places to live. You'll find more information online at spur.org slash join. Our next digital discourse is next Wednesday, May 26th at 5 p.m. It is the future of California transportation policy. Um, over the past year, more people have changed where they go and how they get around than ever before. How will our state's transportation policy react? We're going to hear from the new chairs of the California State Senate and State Assembly Transportation Committees, committees Senator Lena Gonzalez and Assemblymember Laura Friedman about their vision for the future of California's transportation policy. Um, and that should be a really interesting event. Um, today's discourse, which we could have actually titled that too, because the, people, the folks here could talk about that, but we're actually going to be talking about, will California's transportation future be federally funded? Since the beginning of the 20th century, the federal government has issued funding to assist states in the construction and maintenance of highways and bridges along federal roadways as well. As well. Um, and in recent decades, these funding initiatives have expanded in scope to cover a variety of transportation related issues and have evolved into a multi-year comprehensive transportation funding, funding bills known as Surface Transportation Acts. The 2015 Surface Transportation Act, known as the FAST Act, allocated $305 billion in transportation spending over five years and is coming up for reauthorization. At the same time, the White House has centered sustainable and equitable transportation spending in its plan for economic recovery. How can these two opportunities dovetail to benefit California? Today, we're joined by a panel of transportation leaders, transportation avengers, transportation rock stars, I don't know quite what we're gonna call them, um, who have deep insight into the Biden-Harris administration's plans for, um, as well as California for a discussion about federal transportation reauthorization and the opportunities and risks that this reauthorization and, the, uh, and Biden's infrastructure bill holds for our state. I wanted to thank our partners at Bay Area Council, Friends of Caltrain, Seamless Bay Area, and Silicon Valley Leadership Group for co-presenting this event for us. And I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists. Um, um, CEO Philip A. Washington was unanimously selected CEO of um, the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, LA Metro, in 2015. As Metro CEO, Phil manages a balanced budget in excess of $7 billion, is responsible for overseeing between 18 and $20 billion in capital projects, and provides oversight of an agency with 11,000 employees that transports 1.2 million boarding passengers daily on a fleet of 2,200 clean air buses and six rail lines. It's always a little bit humbling to realize how much bigger LA is than the Bay Area. Um, anyway, um, Therese, Executive Director Therese McMillan of the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC, um, uh, also serves as the top executive for the Association of Bay Area Governments, ABAG. Therese previously worked for 25 years at MTC and for more than eight years as MTC's Deputy Executive Director for Policy before her 2009 appointment by then federal, by then President Barack Obama to serve as um, the um, Deputy Administrator for the uh, Federal Trans Administration in the US Department of Transportation. I feel this bio was not, it's not accurate, Therese. Um, um, and um, we, uh, uh, she was, um, uh, she was then promoted and to, um, at USDOT um, and then unfortunately fled to Southern California for which we will forgive her because she eventually came back. Um, Director, um, uh, Director Tokso Mishakin was appointed the 33rd Director of the California Department of Cal Transportation Caltrans by Governor Newsom and sworn in in October 2019. As director, he manages a $15 billion budget and nearly 22,000 employees who oversee 50,000 lane miles of highways, maintain 13,000 bridges, 
and provide permitting of more than 400 public use airports, fund three of Amtrak's busiest intercity rail services, and provide transit support to more than 200 local and regional transit agencies. Oh boy, there's just a lot of employees getting managed by the folks on this Zoom. It's really, really impressive. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that, um, to kind of open up the questions, that was one of the things that was really central to the past year is how do we support um, all the economic activity, especially the employees who work in our transit and transportation systems. And that was a real focus of, um, of, of the sort of the, the, the federal funding. Um, and maybe we can just kind of look back at the unprecedented amount of federal funding that we received and that has been that has been given out in the past year before we look forward to the kind of the upcoming um, transportation measures. And um, I would, I'd be just, you know, I'd, I'd kind of open it up and maybe to, to direct Omar Sharkin first. I mean, if you could just kind of give us a sense of the scale of the funding that was made available by the federal government and, and sort of what, what impact has that had um, in, in California? And is that going to be, can, can we kind of keep that momentum going a little bit? Yeah, that, thanks, Nick. Can, can you hear me clearly? Absolutely. Okay, good. Perfect. Uh, very good afternoon. Good to be with you uh, and the team at SPUR, the leadership at SPUR. Thanks for uh, inviting the Avengers, uh, part of the Avengers team of transportation to be a part of uh, today's conversation. Nick, the last time we spoke, I didn't know you were a commissioner uh, working with Therese, so now your, your name moving forward would be Commissioner Nick, but <laughs> thanks for... <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to, to be a part, uh, to share the stage again with my friends, Phil and, and Therese. Look, I, I think we're starting off on the right foot on this conversation. You, you have to kind of reflect back on 2020 a little bit uh, and the, how we were hit so hard and hampered by, on so many fronts uh, before we talk about uh, what's the opportunity uh, in front of us looks like. And we, we got a, a lot of money. It, it's, I don't think it was necessarily everything we needed, but we got a lot. And let me just kind of break down and, and Therese and, and Phil will be able to explain probably a little bit more detail on some components of this, especially the transit side. But, but big picture, what we, the money we got was what we call relief money. Uh, it was not a stimulus. A lot of people get those two things mixed up. Some people think, uh, you know, we were getting stimulus money. Now, this was a relief to make up for the shortfalls, the deficits that we were facing that were pretty significant. On the highway side, we saw nearly a 40% drop in people driving. On the transit side, it went up to 90, in some cases, 95, 96% drop in ridership. Uh, but the, the money we got in California on the highway side was roughly $912 million. Uh, the relief money that was passed for the entire country was $10 billion. So we got nearly 10% of that uh, at uh, $912 uh, million. And the plan moving forward, working with the CTC and, and partners across the state in CalSTA, the plan moving forward is that we're going to split that money 60-40. 60% of that money is going to stay with the state, uh, Caltrans, to do projects. 40% of that money is going to local government uh, to do projects that they need as well. But again, this is, this is money to make up for those drops in revenue that we all saw, not stimulus money. I think that's an important distinction. And on the transit side, we got roughly $10.3 billion, uh, which is a lot of money. But when you think about the fact that there are more than 300 transit agencies in the state of California, and some people saw up to 95, 96% uh, decrease in ridership. You know, it's, you know, it's gonna help, uh, it's helping, but it's not uh, the full picture of what we need. So, uh, and it's hard, by the way, it's hard to estimate how much the shortfall on the transit side uh, really was, but it's making a difference already as, as ridership starts to slowly pick back up as everybody gets vaccinated uh, across the state. But big picture, that's what the highway side was, 912 million, transit side, 10.3 uh, billion uh, dollars. Um, and, and, and Phil, from your perspective as, as such, such a large transit operator, it, you know, sort of having to like put buses and trains out on the street every day, how, I mean, sort of reflecting back on this past year, 
Um, and maybe also thinking forward, I mean, is, is, did you get, um, was this infusion, was this relief enough to kind of be able to kind of keep your, to, to keep services going? And, and are you looking, you know, do you think this is going to be able to kind of set you up as we start coming out of the pandemic to be able to continue to, to sort of get back to levels of service that, that you were offering before? Um, yes. Well, b before I, before I go there, let me also uh, say, I'm happy to be on this panel with you, Commissioner Nick and, uh, and my friends, uh, uh, Therese and Tokes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was, it was good. It was a shot in the arm uh, for us. Uh, we briefed our board early on during the pandemic, the start of the pandemic, uh, and made some estimates on our revenue loss. Now that includes, uh, as Tokes was saying, uh, uh, for us, uh, primarily sales tax revenue loss. I mean, obviously when you have a shutdown of restaurants and, and you know, the holy, you know, pretty much the entire economy all over the country, but here in LA County, which is the most populous county in America, um, you know, just to give you an order of magnitude, restaurants um, make up about 15% of the sales tax revenue that we collect. And so when you have a shutdown uh, of, let's just say restaurants, uh, huge impact. Uh, we made an estimate that our revenue loss would be about 1.8 billion. Uh, that was uh, at the start of the pandemic. We briefed that to our board and said, Hey, this is our estimate of revenue loss, and we were pretty close uh, in in that estimate in that prediction. The CARES Act money, um, the uh, the CRISA Act money uh, that we just um, uh, sort of processed um, has helped us. Um, so we're not quite at that that loss at 1.8, recovering that just yet, but we're getting close. Uh, in the CARES Act, um, uh, this region got about 1 billion, about 1.06 billion, I think it was, uh, that we had to distribute, that we did distribute to the smaller operators as well, since we're the direct recipient. Um, but uh, it, it has helped us. We incurred a lot of expenses, obviously, uh, as well. So you, you've got the sales tax revenue loss, which is uh, the majority of our, um, uh, uh, revenue, uh, but we also uh, had to pick up PPP costs, you know, for uh, PPP and masks and all of those things, uh, our enhanced cleanings, uh, and we also lost fare revenue. Uh, and so we we had those uh, expenses that we had to, to pick up plus the sales tax revenue loss. Uh, but yes, um, it was a good shot in the arm. It has been a good shot in the arm. Uh, I think we also had a good opportunity to look at what could be uh, with regard to taking cars off the road. I mean, I could actually see the Pacific Ocean from my window. The air, the air quality was that much better. You know what I mean? You know, and so what we have been thinking about uh, is what a new uh, sort of environment and climate and air quality could look like. Um, you know, even after the pandemic. And so uh, we are putting together, we have put together uh, sort of a, um, a uh, task force to look at uh, the improvements and how we can make those permanent uh, that we saw even during the pandemic with less traffic and all of that. And so long answer, but I think that, uh, you know, what we're doing now uh, and what could be uh, is very exciting. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a great point about the additional costs that transit agencies have had to incur during the pandemic. And that's something that it's, it's sort of easy to overlook. Um, so, so looking forward, um, um, you know, there's the big picture over the coming years, there's the possibility that there's going to be two major transportation bills being discussed. I think the, the line that the secretary uses is the secretary Buttigieg uses is like, we're going to make sure that infrastructure week in Washington isn't a joke anymore. So presumably that means that there's going to be a little bit of momentum to pass one of these things. But Therese, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that infrastructure is now coming to mean something different. It's not in, in, in as part of these infrastructure bills. It's 
it's not just kind of concrete in the ground or, or rails on a track. It's kind of a more holistic understanding of infrastructure. What's kind of tell us about that and, and how big of a change is that actually um, going to be? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I can certainly reflect on a couple of things, you know, one being my time in the federal government under the um, Obama administration, where there was, you know, a really conscious um, focus on multimodality in ways that I think that pre previous administrations really hadn't focused on. This idea that you can break out of your own little silos. And so there's the highways with FHWA and transit with FTA and, you know, airports with commerce and whatnot to this idea that we, that, you know, they need to work together in a comprehensive network. And that was really exciting. But beyond that, what was really at the time on the bleeding edge of thinking was maybe USDOT could work with HUD, who could work with EPA on this notion of sustainable communities, right? And that was kind of at the, at the time kind of, you know, mind bending. And while I was quite involved with it and there was definitely some um, gains to think through in terms of, can we coordinate our policy? Can we coordinate our funding? Can we coordinate our priorities? Um, it, it I, I would say that was put on pause with the following administration to a large degree, but is coming roaring back, I think, with uh, the Biden-Harris administration. And one of the things I think that drives that, Nick, was the lessons learned out of the pandemic. Because one thing, and, and I, I'm gonna pick up with what Phil said, he said, we got a shot in the arm with you know, the COVID relief funding for transit. But think about that metaphor. One of the things that is going to drive our coming back will be how the vaccines work in terms of restoring confidence in literally getting back and living in a new normal world. And so I, I remember, um, you know, think a, a discussion I had with Dorval Carter, dear friend with, with some of us who is the head of the Chicago Transit Authority, he used to work with FTA with me. And he said, you know, this was early on in the pandemic and we were, you know, talking about how we were using the first run of cares and whatnot. And he said something that stuck with me, which was, this is all great, but if there isn't enough funding to bring back Chicago, CTA will never come back. And this was at a time, as I recall, the CARES Act didn't have as much funding for state and local government and, and whatnot. And that's been building up and was absolutely present in the ARP. So one of the things that's been fascinating to me about lessons learned out of this, uh, you know, for the federal view, as you say, looking through the front windshield is this notion of intersectionality in terms of how do things work together, how we need to simultaneously vest in infrastructure, not only a broader definition of infrastructure in mobility, which is now broadband, absolutely. I mean, that now is, you know, indis you know indisputably part of, you know, what a new mobility format looks like. But things like with climate change, which you know the Biden Harris is very much in front on, like levees, like is that going to be a core part to protect our transportation infrastructure and become an absolute must-have in terms of how we invest and when? So I think you know there was just I I hope that out of this pandemic and the lessons learned in terms of federal policy in terms of flexibility, in terms of how agencies can work differently and take different perspectives, really carries forward in how a stimulus and or reauthorization package happens. It's very exciting. It is exciting. And um, and it's funny how like the even one word infrastructure at like the big, you know, sort of when took on like so much meaning, we were all, it seems like we can't even sometimes agree on the words that we're using, but, um, but it, it it also seems that some you know that um, that um, that so California has been um, trying to get out in front of this 
of, of, of kind of and show the way for what the federal government could do on sort of integrating kind of different streams of, of infrastructure funding or, and sort of housing and transportation and programs like TCC or affordable housing and stable communities have been really sort of shown the way about how you can kind of integrate this funding. How would you say, Direct Omar Sharkin, that, um, that the sort of the federal spent funding is, is sort of aligning with California's goals, especially around climate equity and, and, and public health? Despite all the rhetoric, rhetoric, are we going to still see like 80% of the money going into highways? Um, <laughs> or, or do you think that we'll actually be getting something different? Two, two different things there, uh, Nick. Uh, number one, uh, from, a, from an alignment standpoint, how we align with this. Um, from a big picture sense, very, very well. Um, I, I think the conversations that are finally taking place nationally, California is a little bit ahead of where a lot of states probably are on this issue. When it comes to issues around, for example, climate, we've had multiple governors in a row who've made issues around climate and the connection to transportation specifically, they've made it a priority. Um, and my current boss, you know, Gov Governor Newsom, his entire campaign platform was run on, he wants to have a California for all, like regardless of ethnicity, gender, ability, orientation, you know, that's, that's the California that he's hoping to see. And so most of the departments, including Caltrans, we've kind of been working on this already anyway. Uh, we're, we're already in line. Uh, so I think we're going to, we're going to fare very well uh, uh, with this, but I, I think it's important, something Therese mentioned earlier about, you know, sustainable communities. What's in front of us right now, I think is, is an opportunity for a great pivot unlike we've ever had before as this convergence of policy and resources come together. We've never had this kind of potential with resources. Now you can debate and question where the money is coming from, whether it's borrowed and it's not really true uh, money, but nevertheless, we got money coming uh, potentially. Um, and this conversation around, uh, around equity and safety, we've never had it at this level before um, where so many people are engaged and we're having like you know, Phil and I just actually just left the meeting where we're, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't know I'm gonna bring this up, but we just had a serious conversation about a project um, in his region where we're saying, we're gonna have to reimagine this differently. And we're both agreeing on this. Uh, it's a big highway project uh, in his region. And we're saying, look, this, you know, 10 years ago, this was okay to say, look, we're gonna do a big widening project here, but leadership across the state saying no, that's not the world we live in today we understand uh, the ills and the harms of some of those past decisions we've made uh, and we need to we need to we need to do differently we need to do better um, and all the signals from the federal government they came out with raise which is the former tiger uh, and infra uh, the infra grant both of those grant discretionary grant programs that Therese knows very well, her organization used to, to run this at the federal level, both of them said climate and equity are like key criteria that they will use to make decision on who gets funding. And we're having these serious conversations at MTC, LA Metro, Caltrans, all these are organizations. Um, uh, so I, I can be more excited. Uh, about this tremendous opportunity as this convergence of resources and policies um, takes place. It's interesting. And as you, when, you know, when you were involved in uh, sort of in, in advising the, the kind of the, the, the administration and as you are continually, do you see them kind of learning from California? I mean, is that, can you sort of trace a sort of a pathway from like the, what the work we're doing here to the kind of what's going to be happening in, in DC or, or, or is, is that giving ourselves a little bit too much credit that there are lots of places around the country that are also doing great work and, and this sort of the ideas are bubbling up from, from everywhere? 
I was just glad to hang with this crew. I, I'll let them. I'll, I'll let them. I'll let them answer that. I, I was a fly on the wall. Phil, yeah. Phil was our leader, and and uh, Therese was was co leader. I was just kind of hanging in the room. So, um, I'll I'll let them answer that that question about how much we influenced that. Because it's you know, and maybe Phil, you can if you want to if you want to talk about this or like just generally because I know those those a lot of those conversations are confidential, but. Um, you know, one of the things that we, because, uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about is we think about as Spur and that a lot of others in California think about is the impact that we can have is obviously on the communities that we serve, but it's also is sort of setting the standard for, for other, for, for the rest of the country and for the federal government. And it's sometimes difficult to know whether that's just like us blowing hot air at ourselves and thinking we're real swell. Um, and whether that's actually kind of true. And I, I just really interested in your perspective, sort of having obviously been doing such amazing work at LA Metro and leading the country in things like free transit and other things to just understand whether you think that that is true, that some of this work is kind of being influencing the kind of what's happening at the federal level. Uh, yeah, well, you, you know, I, I, um, I think a, a couple of things I think about uh, we are on the leading edge, right? We don't want to be on the bleeding edge. We want to be on the leading edge. And so I think when we began to talk about these great initiatives um, in California specifically, because I do think we are the thought leaders in the industry, first of all. I think California agencies not, and, and you know, uh, Teresa is doing great stuff in the Bay Area. Tokes is doing great stuff at Caltrans. We are the thought leaders for the industry. And I will be the first to say that, and I'm not talking trash, okay? Uh, but we, <laughs> but, we, but we, we are some bad folks in a good way. Um, uh, but I, I think with these initiatives, I mean, you know, we've got, uh, we're leading the country on, uh, on, on EVs, right? And, and sort of renovating or, or or transferring from, uh, in our case, CNG, clean natural gas, to electric vehicles. Um, we are talking fareless transit. Uh, we are uh, talking uh, next gen in terms of our bus system, revamping all of that. So we're on that leading edge and we are being considered, I mean, we are being looked at on the federal level uh, for these programs. Now, I believe that with all of us on that leading edge or doing these great things that the federal government should look at us as pilot sites and fund the promotion of these concepts, right? Uh, it's just like a, you know, proving the various concepts, um, you know, in order for this to be sort of replicated on the national level, I do believe that there should be funding to help us with that. That's the first thing, uh, because we're proving the concept. Uh, the, the other thing is most of these things and concepts are local. These are local. I mean, most of the great ideas come from your local areas, and then they are you know, perhaps adopted, um, you know, at the federal level. I mean, you know, when we, I was happy to see just yesterday that local hire has just been reinstated. Uh, this is one of the things that we were uh, beating the drum on uh, during our work on the transition. Um, uh, the three of us uh, were really beating the drum. And yesterday, or maybe today, um, you know, the program has been reinstated. Uh, and so I think that people are hearing, uh, you know, the cries in the wilderness from California in this case, um, on various things that should be replicated. And that is not unusual, right? I mean, you know, most of the great ideas come from local areas uh, and they're, they're uh, adopted at the federal level. So I, I do believe um, that, uh, you know, as Tokes was saying, this idea of equity now and climate, we are at a point right now of great opportunity to adopt some of these things. I mean, when uh, the president signed his executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. Uh, when he signed that executive order, almost like his first week, that was sending a message. 
um, the work that we did on first the policy committee, the infrastructure policy committee, before uh, we did the agency review team work, uh, we wrote about 100 proposed policies around infrastructure. Uh, and that was a group before we started the agency review team. I'm happy to see most of those proposed policies that we wrote. It was a committee of 300 people uh, that I was honored to be the co-chair of, but you're seeing those policies be adopted now and be signed, you know, be approved. And so I think uh, and a lot of those folks that were on that policy committee, that first policy committee that was over a year ago, uh, were from the state of California. Uh, and that is a good thing, but I, I'll stop there. But I, I, I will say that as we prove these concepts uh, around things like uh, electric vehicles, things like fareless transit, all of these, as we become the pilot for those things, the federal government uh, should help us prove the concept. Uh, and uh, when I say help us prove the concept, I'm talking about that do re me, like funding, like money <laughs> um, to, to help us do that. So um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and I, 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 it's, um, you know, I think both of maybe both LA and San Francisco would also love to be a pilot site for congestion pricing. Yeah. Um, yeah, to allow ourselves to generate some of our own money as well. Um, and do you think, is there some, you know, sort of California's transportation system in some ways is leading the country, but in other ways it feels like we're also got a long way to go. What, what do you think the federal, I mean, how do you see the kind of the federal government, Phil, and then I'm gonna ask Therese the same question. How do you see like what the federal government can do over the next year Sort of pushing pushing California to try and address some of the challenges that it has had in trying to align its transportation policy around climate and equity goals. Which I know there's a lot more that's happening under the leadership of Director Omashakin and others, but it's not something where we're there yet in California either. Well, I I, I think that um, uh, you know, New York has that sound, you know, that, that song that uh, if you can make it in New York or something like that, you can make it anywhere or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I say the same thing about California. It, you, you know, if these programs can work, these really out of the box thinking, uh, these, these very innovative programs, whether it is uh, what Tokes mentioned, the conversation we had earlier is, you know, looking to develop some principles around highway projects um that uh, don't include uh you know uh, widening all the time right understanding that some widening makes sense to improve uh air quality for the very communities that we're talking about um but i i think that if we can prove that various concepts and various ideas work in california i think they'll work anywhere they'll work anywhere uh, and and that goes to uh, you know they may have to be some you know some modifications made for rural areas and things like that, um, but um, you know the air quality around our ports, uh, looking to fix those kinds of things. I think if these concepts can be proven here, they can be replicated all over the country. And I think the federal government understands that, uh, and that is why uh, many of our programs are being picked up. Uh, all over the country. So I, I think we should still keep beating the drum uh, mm -hmm. and saying that, um, um, you know, our projects do work and that they should be replicated elsewhere. Yeah. You know, it's 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 funny because I, I just got to jump in. You sound almost like you were born in California, Phil. <laughs> you know, Chicago, Denver guy right You know where I'm from, Southside. <laughs> all right. But, but actually, that's one thing I want to pick up because... While I agree with a lot of what my dear friend said, one of the lessons learned that is still in effect, and I learned it somewhat painfully when I went to, uh, and within like the first couple of months, there's a moniker in Washington, ABC, which means anything but California. And it is alive and well. 
So on a political level, one of the things that's the challenge is there's a balance between leadership and arrogance. <laughs> and I think that one of the things that we, the state of California and for all of the enlightenment and innovation and capacity, we also need to own the fact we're living in the state where we have some of the greatest wealth and income gaps in the entire country. God knows in the Bay Area, that is undisputed. And so there's definitely a sense of don't feel too entitled by the fact that you actually have the capacity to push and do these innovative things and maybe Mississippi doesn't, but in national policy, you got to think of Mississippi. And I learned that really quickly. So one of the things that I think is really important goes to the point that Phil said is to remember that when we come up with these innovative ideas, being able to continually communicate how they can work at a community level and any community, that we don't just talk about Los Angeles and the Bay Area, but we talk about Fresno and the Central Valley and the poorer areas of our state as well and what we're doing to improve and lift them up too. Because one advantage that California has is that the diversity of this state, good and bad, is very much a laboratory for you know, the uh, diversity that the nation sees. And I think we need to play that narrative as well because there is a responsibility not only to show what we are capable of doing, but to teach and to be able to really share and push down and adapt what might work here compared to the real hurdles it might take to do it in you know, a Kansas or you know, um, you know, Rhode Island or wherever the case may be. So it's just one of those things that's just very important to remember when we talk about taking our innovation out in the policy political arena at a national stage. It was quite the education that I learned and, and one that, that I, I remember. And so sort of like building on that, what do you, what, like give, given your experience, you, you know, you were in the Bay Area and then you went to DC and you kind of, it, what do you think that, that this, what, what do you hope for this kind of infrastructure package or set of infrastructure packages? What do you hope that they can help us do differently here in California, other than just kind of accelerating the work we're already doing? What would you hope the federal government could really sort of push us on to do better, either on climate or equity or, or, or other things? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and would love to hear certainly from, from Tokes, from his perspective as a, you know, a state agency. I think, and, and Phil hit, hit on this point, to the degree that we are ahead of the curve on a leading edge and frankly, sometimes can afford to be on the bleeding edge. Maybe we can afford, literally afford, to be able to push and do things that are far more risky because of the inherent capacities that we have that, you know, again, should be rewarded, should be supported with the notion that it's done to try to identify and, and um, where innovation can then be recrafted to apply and push down to, you know, the rest of the country. Um, climate change, I think, is, is a classic example. I mean, we've got, what the hell are we doing about drought and wildfire and, they, I mean, it's all here. All of it is here except for hurricanes and I'm sure at some point that'll happen too. So, you know, having us lead on the innovation with the idea, not of just being rewarded for the privilege of doing that, but for sharing the lessons learned, that's what I think is a real exciting part about being in, you know, in a in a shared sort of federal policy because the climate of competition is the first place where people go, right? And figuring out a way that that can and look, I'll just say it again: the fact that in public health, in the middle of a pandemic, we were able finally to step up and provide vaccines for free 
okay, for free with a focus on those who most need it. That was crazy. I mean, that was to me one of the most incredible lessons coming out of this pandemic that made me really proud. And, and thank you, you know, Joe and Kamala for leading that. And it took us a while the hell to get there. But once we got there, that's what is, you know, it's that energy that I think California could play, for example, in climate and the like. So just a thought. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, when my wife and I got vaccinated at the Kaiser, at the, um, with Kaiser at, the, at the, the Moscone Center in San Francisco, we both started crying because it was like, it was government at its like most beautiful. It was like, you, it's like when you sort of first walk into something like, you know, Union Station in DC or something. And it's just this, like, you feel that what was happening was that people were so proud of what they could accomplish together, not on their own, but what they could accomplish together. And they built these monuments to that dream that like we can do so much more together and that i don't know that that's we, we sometimes lose that and and yeah um i so um anyway away from my tearing up and my emotions back to the matter at hand um so um you know um director mishak in your you know in in dc active transportation walking and biking is often not considered transportation. <laughs> um, that I don't I don't know what they consider it, but it's um, and and it's and the federal government has really sort of systematically underinvested in those types of um, in in those types of investments. Was it seems like we could be at a moment where where that's changing, and certainly Secretary Buttigieg talks a lot about the complete streets that he built in um, when he was mayor. Um, do you see that kind of shift happening? Was that sort of a an active conversation um, that you were participating in? Um, and uh, and do you think there's, or, or do you think that's like ultimately we're going to revert to to the to the sort of the norm on that one? No, we can't afford to do that, Nick. We we can't afford to revert back to the old on this. And without going through a lot of detail, it's one of the things that the three of us talked about a little bit. Uh, in the transition um, was how important this component was as well. The transit part we talked about extensively, but this this component as well, the transportation alternatives program, which is the main set aside. You talk about the underinvestment, the underfunding. Uh, as as good as the work that Therese and the USDOT team did was it, uh, for this for that period. The FAST Act was a $305 billion program for five years, $305 billion. For that entire five years, the set aside for specific to active transportation through the, the TA program, it's a little over 4 billion. So less than 1.5%, less than 2% of the entire United States budget was set aside for active transportation. Absolutely nuts. Um, but there have been signals. If you look at the AJP, um, I, I think it's three or four times more uh, there's, than it's ever been set aside for, for, for uh, active transportation um, and a lot of money for safety as well. Uh, I think close to $20 billion, I think was the number I saw that was being proposed to address um, safety issues specifically rated, related to active transportation. I, I just don't think we can afford to, to revert back to the old. Um, the, we saw how important this mode was as a as a true transportation mode through the pandemic, when people couldn't get in crowded spaces anymore on rail and buses, um, uh, when people weren't uh, driving as as much anymore. Uh, you know, our, our blue collar workers and even white collar workers across the, the state uh, were on bikes. They were walking uh, to, to get to work. So this is. You know, one of the things that I can't stand about that name, Transportation Alternatives, which is the, the program that funds this, is it makes it sound like it's like, oh, you, it's an alternative. I, I've always said if I had the, 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 the magic wand or I had the opportunity, I would call it, I'd call it Transportation Essentials. <laughs> like uh, like this, this is an essential component to mobility within neighborhoods and communities, is creating uh, more walkable and bikeable communities. 
so uh, I don't think we can afford to revert back to the old Nick. And you know, um, uh, Phil, one of the one of the and this is a question also from the audience. You know, what similarly to how like you know walking and biking has been nudged off to the side in DC for a long time, trans, uh, funding for transit operations has not been centered in 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 federal funding for for a long time. Um, and and yet, uh, you know, as you obviously experience firsthand, you know, if, if, the, if the federal government only helps you buy the bus, it doesn't help a lot because someone's got to drive it um, and maintain it. Do you see, is that something that was kind of a, a sort of a, a part of the discussions that, that, that you've been having? And, and do you see that being able to change over the course of this year with like a more system? systemic long-term kind of commitment to transit operations rather than just in the relief context that we saw over the last year? Well, I definitely hope so. Uh, you know, we, uh, during the uh, transition period, we, we definitely uh, beat the drum on that in terms of uh, operations. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I think if we're serious about uh, reducing our carbon footprint and if we're serious about um, you know, the climate and all of those things, then we will put more funding to mass transit. Uh, you know, we had a lot of discussions um, on the safe uh, return uh, to transport. And, and actually, when we set up the uh, transition team and the agency review team, uh, we set it up in such a way that each person was a subject matter expert in some area. Uh, and uh, Therese was actually the subject matter expert in the safe return to transport, I think we called it. Uh, and uh, we uh, put together some thoughts around that uh, in our deliverables uh, to talk about how, uh, you know, we should um, uh, create uh, you know, various principles and various thoughts around uh, the, the safe return uh, to transport. So I think in terms of operations, absolutely, uh, there should be uh, money dedicated to that. There should also be funding dedicated uh, in a big way to um, a state of good repair. Uh, you know, what we have said uh, through various measures, definitely the measure down here uh, in Los Angeles, Measure M, uh, we argued for a slice of the funding to go and be dedicated to state of good repair. I mean, we would not uh, buy a car and never change the oil, <laughs> you know? I mean, th th this is, you know, one of these things where um, uh, the federal government, I think, uh, needs and I think will uh, pay attention to transit operations and fund that. I think it's absolutely essential if we're serious about uh, getting people out of their cars and single occupant vehicles. So, yes, I think... I'm optimistic and I think it will it will happen. That would be amazing. Um, I, I, it's just inspiring that all of you were kind of the ones that these ideas were kind of centered in, in the discussion around the Biden administration. Um, you know, a question from the audience, which I think is really interesting and I'm gonna just keep on rotating around. Therese, um, and anybody else can answer this one too, because do you think the changes that we're seeing now and how the Biden administ Biden Harris administration is approaching these issues, do you think it's because the public perception has changed? Do you think it's because the average kind of, you know, American in their car is sort of changing how they think about these issues? Or do you think it's that there's now just a greater understanding from like transportation professionals um, and others who are influencers about the right direction to take? And, uh, and, and, and that's what's kind of influencing this quite dramatic change in kind of in, uh, in, in sort of objectives for, for this infrastructure package compared to the last. I think it's both. Um, insofar as, you know, a lot of the studies and academic arguments and whatever aren't new. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we've seen them for a long time. I mean, there's been, decades of work speaking to the, you know, environmental degradation caused by cars and um, the need for, you know, more compact, you know, communities, you know, to make transit successful and the like. And I think that's, 
that's one of the things, I guess, if, if, if I was going to have a sort of cautionary tale around this on the question of, you know, should the federal government be more in the business of, you know, supplying operations for transit and whatnot. And I definitely think there's the space for that. But at the end of the day, for transit to work effectively, it needs to be, and, and you know this because we are tackling this right now in the Bay Area and a big scale, it needs to operate in an environment where it's competitive as a essential option, not an alternative <laughs> to the car. And that is as much about land use and housing as it is about anything in transportation. So to me, I think what I'm beginning to see is a recognition in the public space, as well as the professional space about this intersectionality of these issues. That to me is what's exciting and different that you're not that, the fact that people can see across, um, and 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 uh, across mode, uh, not even modes uh, of disciplines, and and see how these elements of our society really need to work together in order to advance a you know a, a improved outcome, particularly for those that are most vulnerable. That's the exciting change I see for transportation. That transportation is not now in its own little bucket, own little silo, but really being seen as an essential part of this complex ecosystem that is our cities and, and frankly, our lives. Can I pick up on that, Nick? Because I mm -hmm. think uh, Therese is really touching on something with this, uh, this intersectionality. Um, uh, you know, I was on a uh, House uh, subcommittee panel or testimony uh, about a week ago uh, and the idea of affordable housing uh, and how that is tied in, uh, in this case, uh, to higher speed rail. Uh, we were actually talking about the private sector uh, building rail from Las Vegas to um, Los Angeles. Uh, and the idea of affordable housing uh, in the northern area uh, of, of um, LA County, particularly in a place like Palmdale uh, and Lancaster and the Apple Valley, uh, where the medium cost of a home is about $350,000. And if there were a higher speed rail to get from affordability, if you will, to the employment center in less than an hour, and that intersectionality uh, of tying the tra transportation and higher speed rail uh, to job centers. This is not a commercial for high-speed rail in California. I'm, I'm just, I'm just talking about that intersectionality. That's that, our next program, by the way, in case you're wondering. Right, yeah. right. That, that that Therese is talking about. I think we are connecting the dots uh, with all kinds of things. Um, I don't think there's any other uh, uh, profession, if you will, or industry that touches more people than transportation. Maybe healthcare. Um, but but this intersectionality question, I think, is a very relevant one. Yeah, it's um, uh, direct. So I guess we're coming up to the end of end of this um, end of this session. That was that was an appropriate kind of big final question. I'll ask everybody a rapid fire question right at the end, um, um, which is going to be if you could if you could have one earmark, what would it be? Um, and uh, but before that. I wanted to thank our, uh, our co-presenters um, for this event, um, the Bay Area Council, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, um, uh, Friends of Caltrain and Seamless Bay Area. I wanted to thank everybody who's come um, uh, and, and sort of to, for this event in, in the audience and ask questions. Um, I particularly wanted to thank our panelists, um, Executive Dire Director McMillan, Director Omishakin and CEO Washington. And please, everybody else can also put in the chat. If you had one earmark, um, what would that earmark be? So um, I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, and it might, it, this might be like choosing your favorite baby, but that's okay. That's what we have to do all the time in this business. So I'm going to start with Therese, if that's, if that's okay. If you, if you, if you were, if you could have an earmark, what would it be? 
It would be a block grant that I could use working with the commission to do the highest, best need, whatever that is. There we go. So Congress people listening in, <laughs> the earmark should be a block grant to MTC. I am totally in favor of that. And the governor has actually proposed that in his budget. So um, so he's he's ahead of everything. OK, um, Director Omasharkin, if you had if you had an earmark. Yeah. Similar to Therese, uh, infrastructure for people uh, would be what it's called. So not a not a specific uh, name or project or anything, but letting communities have an opportunity to say, this is what we need to get the best life that we're looking for for our people. I'd, I'd, I love that. Like the community led transportation planning is, is where it's at. OK, um, Phil. Uh, I want a uh, a one trillion dollar plus infrastructure bill. <laughs> there we go. You know, there was actually a one, almost a one trillion dollar, but I think it was a one billion dollar earmark request from a congressman from Louisiana for uh, for what he described as the most gnarly, the gnarliest interchange in the United States, or something like that. Um, so I'm gonna um, if. Um, if uh, if I could answer my own question, if I got if I got one earmark, I think it would be for a bus lane on the Bay Bridge. Um, but um, thank you everybody for uh, for for coming, and thank you again for our panelists. You, the work that you're doing is inspiring us, and I'm thrilled that it's also inspiring the Biden Harris administration. Um, and uh, and we're looking forward to hopefully getting a lot of amazing things out of DC this year. So Great. thank you so much for coming. Thank you all.